Hello, welcome back. This week is me solo. So whenever I do the solo podcast, I like to do a little housekeeping reminders. Um, Reminders that we have a Patreon account. So in that Patreon account, by supporting Horsemanship Unlocked, there are different tiers. And if you support me, I will support you. So if you go to patreon.com, look up or I think it's just slash Horsemanship Unlocked, go ahead and look us up. In the $5 tier, you will get these podcasts early, a whole week early from when it goes out on YouTube and Spotify. And that is our halt. Our walk tier is $10, and you get these podcasts early, and you get um, Q&A video responses to question and answers, where I answer questions that come up from... Patreon members or their questions that come up in clinics. I just answered one that was a question that came up in a conversation with a friend. So anything horsemanship related and especially on the um, self-help horsemanship journey. And then our trot tier is $20. And in that you get all of the above plus Um, science articles where we go through and I break down and summarize um, scientific peer-reviewed journal articles that are on welfare, cognition, psychology, learning, all of equitation studies, stuff that, that deal with us becoming better horsemen ourselves and learning more and adapting our philosophies based on research. And then our canter is $50 a month. I find the most out of the canter tier personally, because that comes with all of the above, plus behind the scenes training. So video footage of me working with my horses, working with a student, working at a clinic, and then projected to me over the video, pausing the video, talking about what I'm doing, the decisions I'm making, things that could, the reasons why I made certain decisions, what decisions could have been better, what I would have done. I just finished one where I was watching myself from six months ago. So I was kind of teaching myself (laughs) and some of the things that I would have done better even six months in the future, as I am also on my horsemanship journey. And then the last tier is a gallop tier where you get all of that plus one-on-one training with me where you can send me your videos we can talk through zoom or over the phone and i can give you a virtual lesson from a distance so check out patreon i think you guys if you're into this type of stuff will absolutely love it and you can widen your you know horsemanship knowledge as we go through this journey together aside from that summer camp registration is still open and it's going to be great. It's in Minnesota. It is a day camp. We have camps for kids and teens and adults. There are camps going on in June and July, and then in August, there is a camp that is both circus arts and horses. It's just less horses a day, but if you really want to focus on the horses only one, there will be opportunities to be able to try flying trapeze as Flying Colors Trapeze has drop-in classes. So if you guys have any questions about registration with camp, just let me know. I can answer all your all your questions. Um, it is a blast and anyone can do it. You do not have to have prior acrobatic or horsemanship or trick riding experience. The horses and the equipment are provided and I know it's in Minnesota and it's a day camp, but there are no other opportunities like this that we are getting students from Washington State, Alaska. I have someone coming from Alaska this summer. I'm super pumped. Um, Canada, Florida, Georgia. I had someone come from Vermont last year, all over the place. So if you're out of town, but you can make travel arrangements. I encourage you to do so because it is a once in a lifetime opportunity 
and it is super great fun. We take the horses swimming in the lake. Minnesota is the land of the land of 10,000 lakes. And we make a show on Friday, even the adults. So check that out at flyingcolorstrapeze.com so you can check out the rates and the schedule and the number of spots still open. Here we go. Let's jump into it. Today I wanted to talk solo about the idea of grace and gratitude in horsemanship. And it's just been something that I've been reflecting on lately because of my experiences. So as I've as I dove into the realm of natural horsemanship, I found it to be a solace for me from coming from traditional horsemanship. However, there are always things that I take away from trainers and there are things that I leave behind. There are things that I decide not to carry with me. And one of those things was being really nitpicky with the animal, wanting it to yield from the ever so slightest bit of pressure. I understood the magic in viewing that, thinking, wow, that horse is super responsive and that to the lightest touch. But now when I look at it, I think that it is hypervigilant and it causes a hypervigilance in the handler to be watching the horse and expecting that close of motions. Now, some of my thoughts and ideas and opinions might not sit with you, and that's okay. I believe that the biggest changes come from questioning things. So question what I say, and question what you do, and question what you've been taught. That's all I do. <laughs> I have lots of internal struggles with horsemanship and I'm constantly trying to filter and I'm trying to sift through the information that has been given to me through the information that is out there especially through people who th claim that they have all the answers I can tell you right now that I don't I don't have all the answers but I'm looking and I will look to find the right answers and in that process you find the wrong answers and then you put them in the trash, but you got to know why you put them there. So the hypervigilance just didn't allow grace for the horses. It was, I taught this, this is the way it should be done. Why isn't it happening? But I want to remind people of just relationships in general. In order to make a good relationship work with a person, you have to have grace. In order to make a good relationship work with yourself, you have to have some grace. And the reason I've been thinking about this lately is because of a clinic I recently had. The woman who owned the barn and she trained the horses that I was working with and we taught trick riding that same day. I allowed this to happen because she was very safe and knew what was needed from a horse to be safe for a child. Now, there are some trainers out there who think that they know what that means, but their standards are different than mine when it comes to children trick riding on horses. But this woman who I worked with had, in my opinion, very, very safe horses. You could hit that whip on the ground right behind them, and they would not jolt forward. They were very relaxed. Great. They were not going to scooch forward, you know, just by seeing the whip when a kid was on them. Speaking with her and then going to see it for myself and working with the horses myself, these horses were super safe, and she had gymnastics background girls riding horses so it made for a perfect combo to be able to work with the horses that day and do some real trick riding mostly at a walk and a trot but it was awesome and it was quite magical to see it happen 
And one of the things we talked about was a horse in particular that was a little more on the sensitive side and that she prepared her student for the clinic as there was worry that we were going to give this horse some grace. We just knew the kind of mental state she had been in lately and they knew because of some of the rides they had that, hey, it's an educational experience. We have nothing to prove. Let's give her some grace. And then because we put no expectations on her and we gave her grace, she actually did wonderfully. No, she was not at the level that the other steady Eddie trained, very quiet horse was. But because we did not put expectations on this mare and we gave her grace, this child was absolutely over the moon then with what they had accomplished. Walked away from that clinic with so much gratitude and so much confidence that things and events that they were cautious about signing up for, they were ready to do it because, you know, if they came in with that attitude, they could not fail. And yes, I was responsible for teaching them tricks that day, but I won't take all the credit. This woman and her faith and her belief and her, her patience and giving the horse grace was what also set this up to be super successful for this student and her inner journey through this clinic and this weekend. And it was grace that stuck with me because I have seen some very, very gentle, smart handling of a horse but remember, the horse's mental capabilities are of a three-year-old child that does not speak the same language as you. So if you set a horse up perfectly in the aisle, standing still, and then you get sidetracked talking to somebody, and that horse has the attention span of a, you know, and the mental capabilities of a three-year-old, like, of course they're going to forget what you asked and start you know, moving their feet and getting a little bored. But then some trainers or handlers will pick that up and and correct it and correct it. And I get it. I get why consistency is key. But from a relationship standpoint, oh, watching two, like if someone did that to me, like, and I know it's not the same, but still, Watching too closely, feeling like you're getting corrected all the time when the human was the one who got sidetracked and started talking to someone. So if you're getting sidetracked, I can't, I'm not allowed to get sidetracked. That's a double standard. Grace, like, okay, yeah, I set you at a wall at a halt, but then I started talking and 20 minutes later, you stepped two steps forward. Ah, uh, okay. I'm going to allow it to happen. Maybe we'll take that horse on a hand walk, a couple laps around the arena, let them get the, get the antsies, move their feet, get the itchies out, and then we'll do that halt again. And instead of me getting sidetracked, I'll stay focused and I won't make you stand there so long. There. In that moment, both individuals are taking responsibility. But when we constantly put it on the horse, that's not fair. And they'll take it. They'll take it because they don't know any better. But in this journey, this horsemanship journey, we really can only look towards ourselves and the decisions we make. So we need to have some grace and understanding for the horse and what they're capable of and what they can handle and what you've already put on their plate. Sometimes grace looks like, ah, I put a little too much on your plate. Let me take some off for you. Instead of saying, why didn't you finish this plate? 
I don't understand. Because you're the human. You put too much. If they cannot easily take everything off the plate, that means you put too much there. Not, not that they can't handle that much. You put too much there. You overestimated. You were hypervigilant. And you put too much expectation on the animal. You got to have a little grace. It's okay. If I mess up, I want to know that I'm not always going to be in trouble. I didn't intend to mess up. It wasn't my intention. Mistakes can be made. And I feel love when I'm around the people who understand that mistakes can be made and that it's not going to be judged and held against me and I'm not going to automatically just get corrected for it. And the same thing, same thing with gratitude. Oh, I'm so grateful for a beautiful day and what I get to do with my horses. I'm so grateful about the training and the work we've spent together and how they allow beginners and children to do what they do on them and that I can have a nice living, even if it might be check to check and week to week, you know, our needs are covered and it's amazing and I have gratitude for them. And that keeps me in this space of being very grateful for the role of this animal and what they allow us to do. They allow us because we make them allow us. If we can switch that to more gratitude, we can have a more equal partnership and we probably will actually get more out of the partnership if we have some gratitude and we have some grace. Oh, I just want to pause and see if you guys can reflect on a moment in time or a, maybe a training session you've had lately. And let's go back and reflect on that for a second. So this is a little bit of a meditative exercise and meditation helps with having grace and having gratitude because it puts us in the moment. Sometimes when we get too result-driven and we want ribbons, we want to put a price tag on a training project and we want to make money off of it and we want the good contracts in the entertainment industry, we get too result-driven. We got a show coming up. This horse has to have a good Spanish walk. Are you putting a timeline on it? And it's causing hypervigilance and it's causing overcorrection and it's not allowing mistakes to happen and it's putting the relationship at a risk. It's about the journey and everyone's got their thing. But for me personally, I loved performing, but I love teaching because teaching takes the timeline away from things. When I perform, and I'm, I, I can perform what I know, and I can perform what I we are confidently good at. But then, of course, when you start something like trick riding, you want to learn more tricks. You want to keep going, and that's good, until it starts becoming something that you need to rely on. So your act needs to be quality. So you have a good reputation and you get hired and you have the best act and you're the best rider and all these things. And then it's too much pressure. And it's, again, being too harsh on yourself, too harsh on the animal. You're over picking what's not good. So you're not having gratitude with what is good and where you're at now. And remember, you are always exactly where you need to be. So if you feel stuck, if you feel frustrated, you're not going to get past that until you give yourself some grace and then you have gratitude for where you are and then you will skyrocket forward. So meditation. I'm going to call a couple people out here, but with love. I did a clinic recently where we were really starting from the ground up and I really talked about not having a timeline, releasing some expectations, having grace, 
And in order to do that, taking time to meditate, clearing your mind, being an observer of your own thoughts. <sighs> so you can start fresh when you are in the arena with your horse and not taking your feelings or your shitty day into the arena. Day two of the clinic, I walked in and I said, how many of you meditated this morning? And one of the ladies giggled and said, no, I didn't. Nobody else did. I taught it, I said it, and I meant it. Of course anyone can do what they want going forward. But if you want real changes, and if you want your training to look different, you have to do things differently. You cannot do things the same and looking through with the same eyes and expecting different results. That is the definition of insanity. I'm just the trainer. I'm just the clinician. I can't do it for you. I can tell you what to do. I can set it up. I can say, hey, you should meditate. We can sit down before training and we can say, here's your hour lesson. Let's take 10 minutes to meditate and quiet our mind but I can't do it for you. So if you come to me and you want different results, you have to do things differently. Can't make you do it. And that's fine. If you don't want to do it, it's fine. But then when you come brawling back and wonder, why does this not feel different? I don't know. You didn't do what I... I gave you a suggestion. Did you try it? Did you at least try it? Try it. Try it. Not, you know, don't knock it till you try it. So, meditating, clearing the head, clearing your mind, letting those emotions go, breathing into the moment, grounding into the moment, being present is going to help with that training and that and having gratitude for what you're doing and being in that state with the animal. So let's go back to that exercise and think. Close your eyes, take a nice deep breath. Think about a time you were working with your animal recently. Did it feel flustered? Or was it a good feeling? Being there, were you able to let your daily life go? Or did it just feel like you compiled more on top of your daily life stressors because your horse isn't at where you wanted it to be at, your training is not at where you expected it to be at? Or is it a place where you can feel a fur coat and smell the smells of a barn and hear the horses chomping and eating their hay and being there and grounding into that and letting your daily stuff go because it's the little things it's the things that originally brought you to the barn that we are sometimes passing over and overlooking and no longer being grateful for that <laughs> And that's, those are the things that brought us there. And then we got brainwashed into needing ribbons and needing, you know, a nice price tag on a horse and, and needing the best high school moves. And, but what brought you there in the first place? Because you didn't even know. You just wanted, there was something you were drawn to. When you worked with your horse, were you frustrated? Or did you have fun? Did you get mad at them for their mistakes? Or did you laugh at them? Did you pet them? Did you give them treats? Did you give them scratches? Were they spooking? Was their jaw locked? Were their eyes big? Were they jumping out of their skin? Or was their head relaxed? Were they nibbling at you and being curious about you and wanting to be near you? Were they dropped? So they were gelding? 
<laughs> meaning they were super relaxed and super into what you were doing? Were they offering you tricks? Or was it a struggle to just keep them near you and stop their feet from moving? Did they stand quietly? Or were they running, walking in circles around you, almost tangling you up in that rope? And then how did you feel when you were done? Did you feel good? Did you feel like your mind was clear? And did, did it feel like that was just what the doctor ordered? Or did you feel yucky? Did you feel mad? Did you blame the horse? How long was the session? Was it 20, 30 minutes? Or was it an hour and a half? Did you end early getting you excited for the next session you'd have together? Or did you push to end on a good note and that you were just fr flustered and frustrated and your horse was just tired? I want you to think about those. Pat Pirelli said that you should walk away from a training session, look at your horse and say, was it as good for you as it was for me? And whether he truly believed that, he's a man too, you know, I, I'm i not preaching to Pat Pirelli, I'm just quoting what he said because I think it's great. And I think about that often because I'm human too. And I've had a lot of pressure on my business and my horses. And then I walk away with a yucky feeling. Because maybe I had expectations and it was a spooky day outside. So I had to drop my agenda and just work on desensitizing and, you know, half circles back and forth. And that got me frustrated because I didn't get to work on what I wanted to work on. Or, you know, dropping the agenda at all and thinking, what am I doing and why am I doing this? And what's actually important here? kind of reminds me of the pandemic. You know, this was a time for people to drop the things, the extracurriculars, the entertainment, the concerts, the bars, the sports teams. And when all those result-driven things are gone and all we have left is the moment, the journey, the home life, is it good? Is it happy? Are you only doing those things for the other things that can be taken away so easily? So if we take away the competition and we take away the ribbons and we take away the contracts, are you just happy being with, working with, being around your horse and nurturing your horse for what they need? socialization, a clean stall or dry lot, movement, grooming, and good diet. Is that alone happy, good for you to provide those things? Or must you demand something in return? You don't give to get. That will backfire. And that's a issue in human relationships too, giving to get, right? But you can also just give because it feels good and you're grateful for those moments and you're just grateful to have that horse in your life and what it does for you on a personal level without it actually doing something for you. And in that place, you will be rewarded. You will get something back it just might not look like what you thought it would and actually it's probably better than what you originally imagined with this result driven place so it's interesting because horsemanship is not just what it seems it's a lifestyle it's an inner journey if it's just an outer journey, just like the pandemic, that can be taken away from you so quickly. 
the industry can shut down. We got racetracks closing. We have other industry parts of the industry shutting down because of the abuse and the neglect and the means to get there. Five plus fly, five equals 10. So does eight plus two. So does seven plus three. So does six plus four, nine plus one. If we are going to 10, it is more important for me to know how you got that answer. So if you got a beautiful Spanish walk out of your horse, did you, how did you do it? Did you catch them pawing and then reward them and use treats? Is that horse dropped and happy and relaxed when he does it? Is he offering it? Or did you whip him in the leg? Did you pull it up with the rope? Did you force it to happen? Did you reward? Or was the only reward a release of pressure? Was the only reward to get that whipping to stop? I care about how you get to 10 and it will sit with you and affect you in the long term. Even if you got a nice check because you sold that big beautiful horse that can Spanish walk, it's a lovely little thing we call karma because the way it's not what you do, it's how you do it. It's intention, it's the unseen. And the unseen is the imprisonment of if this journey is actually making you a better person and a better horse person, horse man, horse woman, or not, is the journey actually making you a more crooked person, a more manipulative person, a more abusive person? I know reputable trainers out there who are taking horses in and not doing training and charging that train that owner saying it's going to take longer and they're not being honest and they're just taking money sure they're not working and they're getting money in their pocket but does that feel good to act like that and to do that is that good for the the people in the barn to see you doing that it's not about what you do it's how you do it and grace and gratitude is going to save your relationship with your horse. And like I said, maybe you don't care about the relationship with your horse. But when the shows are gone, the contracts are gone, and that's all you have left. All you have left is the truth. And how you look at your life and look at everything and the journey you took to get there, not just getting there. And what you got when you got there. I said it in a different podcast, but if you want a ribbon, I'll buy you one right now. I can print them for pretty cheap and I can put whatever I want on it too. Congratulations. You're the world's most manipulative, abusive horse person. Here you go. We got people in FEI dressage riding with double bridles and photos of that horse's mouth open tongue out and the tongue is dark blue okay you're an olympic level dressage rider but look how you got there you'll have to live with that not me i just hope that horse gets a break and gets to recover from that and so is what you're doing very true you had to push and pull and prod and put two bits in the horse's mouth in order to get there doesn't seem very great it's time the horse industry takes a hundred foot step back and take a view at the at what's actually going on get away from everybody who's deep in that hole because they all have their opinions and they will all justify their actions and they will you know give you an explanation of why it, it, you know it is the way it is he's got to know this and I got to push him into this and this is just a reaction to this take a hundred foot back and simplify it a little bit and if that causes an ucky feeling or that move wouldn't happen without you know big spurs two whips and two bits mm. It's a lot simpler than what you think. Let's give our animals some grace and let's give, let's have some gratitude 
when we go into our practice. And A, you will find a much better relationship with your horse, a horse that wants to be with you. You will know you are doing right by the animal. And it's like a monk lifestyle. Like you will feel better. You will not harbor yucky feelings and you will not be one of the numbers that is just a manipulative, pushy, abusive, neglectful person. You can you can do right by the animal. You can do the best you can, given the state that the world is in right now. And you you can be the change that the industry needs to see. And then you can sleep better at night and know that you did a positive impact and not a negative and not be a wolf in sheep's clothing like yeah um let me know what you guys think i would love to hear more people just come forward and be honest um i would love discussions about the transformation that they've had in horsemanship because I know that a lot I'm not the only one out there a lot of us have come from places where we were taught to be super pushy and super manipulative and then we're posting memes about the beauty of the horse yet we're making them do x y and z and it's like what you talked about freedom and beauty and you completely took away this animal's freedom <laughs> So, you know, we're in this together and part of the journey and being better is to not only look at the industry, but also look at ourselves. And then when you look at yourself, it doesn't just magically get better. Then it's like, okay, well, if that was, if everything I've been taught so far is what not to do, what do I do? I'm not telling you what to do. I'm opening a place to talk about it, to open up, to talk about our feelings. And I'm giving suggestions based on how I have had to look into that dark mirror as well and then blaze a different trail. Blaze a different trail and then watch the, the results transform my life. My horsemanship life and then my myself and how I feel about working with animals. It's like, you know, I know people who say that they don't ride horses because they like horses. Think about that for a second. <laughs> they don't want to make make them do things and force. And, you know, even if it's soft, even if it's gentle, you know, liberty training is a thing that gets sold as this beautiful, spirited, freedom thing. It's still manipulation. But there's always better ways that we can do it. We can do more reward. So we're not only telling the horse to move away from pressure and what not to do, but we're rewarding them for what they do right. Um, there's suggestions. From the horse so if you're making your horse canter and he keeps breaking gait and he wants to trot i do understand the importance of keeping him cantering until you ask for a trot but maybe just take a half a lap and then let him trot working with him if he's, he's tired right like unless you're in a position all the time where someone is constantly telling you what to do like the military and you're just doing it because you have to if you're not there you are the commander and you are being power hungry and you are abusing your power right so there are things we can do to make it better and grace having grace for the animal and having gratitude with our training are automatically ways that we start to get to a more whole holistic wholesome journey yeah so 
recent events caused me to be interested in this topic. I'd love to discuss it more. I'm sure we'll be coming back to it. I'd love to hear your insights and I'd love to open up the floor to a a non-judgmental, um, a healing platform, an open place for communication, for storytelling, and to just be there for each other. Um, horsemanship is a super judgmental place. I mean, we literally pay money to go and be judged. And then we pay money to go and be judged in, in a result-driven place you know so and that's fine that like there's great you know there's great things that can come from it there's bravery there's you know learning competition learning how to lose not just win um there there are nothing is bad and nothing is nothing is all bad nothing is all good there, there are some great things, but sometimes things get too, too heavy and we have to take some weight off of it and we have to keep this check and balance. Like results are good. We don't do things to not have results, but if you're only result driven, then we tend not to focus on the priorities and the, the expectations and the journey and have appreciation for how we got there or having an awareness and discernment for how we're getting there. Yeah. So join me on this journey. I'm glad you can chime in today and I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments and I'd love to be a support for you if you have also felt the same way and now you are also a fish through water going through the muck trying to find the clearance. I'm here for you. I'm in the clearance. I'm in the coral reef. Join me. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll catch you next time. Have a great, have a great day.